Hello. Well then, can everyone hear me okay? I, I don't know if that was... You actually need me to... Okay. We'll get there. I feel like I'm about to give a lecture. And I am, actually. So I'm glad you're all here. No. Um, oh, sorry, this has just been such a whirlwind getting here. Um, how's everyone doing? Yeah, so parallels, hey? Who saw that coming? Let's wait for everyone to get in. I won't do that again, it's okay. Hi. So I'm really nervous. I haven't spoken to this many people since I did GCAP, um, which was 2019. Um, so it's, it's been a bit of a journey. I think we've all had a bit of a long one to get here, I think. Um, but you know, before we all get started, I wanted to acknowledge and respect all the members of the Kulin as the traditional owners of the land in which we're meeting this evening um, and pay respects, recognizing the elders both past and present. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to fully begin this because it's been such a whirlwind um, leading up to Games Week. Um, I'm, as I'm sure all of you know, like we're, we're game developers, we're making a game. And so when this all kind of came up, it, you know, we had to shift gear pretty quickly to try and get it all together uh, within the X amount of months. Um, and it's been an absolute, absolute whirlwind trying to get it, everything organized. Um, it was relied on so many people. Um, I, <laughs> I can't even explain just how hard everyone has been working for, for, I don't even know how long anymore. I've completely lost track of time. Anyway, um, yeah, so I'm a little bit disorganized at the moment, but we're just going to have to get through this. Um, so we have a, about nine, game developers who are going to be presenting. I can't believe this is recorded. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> this is actually why we're not live streaming it. I knew I'd just be a mess, but anyway. Love you, Jerry. <laughs> Love you, Jerry. I, feel, I feel really weird with this. I feel like I'm competing with this block. Uh, anyway, um, I'll get into all the thanks and everything really soon, um, but I would actually really like um, to bring up Claire uh, from Freeplay to give a couple of words, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Claire from the Freeplay board, and I've been selected to do the speechy thing, so I'm sorry. It's going to be real formal and stuff. Um, uh, like Terry, I really can't express how good it is to see you all here. I think when the tickets for Parallels went live, I cried because I'm very professional. But the last couple of years have been so emotional for all of us and especially the tiny little team that runs Free Play. I can't look at Chad or I'm definitely going to cry. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you, all the partners, all the friends, all the attendees who just keep coming back to support um, the independent, experimental, artful games that we all love and care about so much. Even as some of us were losing our incomes, our studios, our social spaces, <laughs> our minds a little bit, um, your support for these games and the makers of these games has been really overwhelming. Thank you very much. I also want to thank the over 100 of you who took part in the recent review that we did for free play. There was a time not so long ago where we really seriously thought that free play would not continue. We've been around for almost 20 years. It feels like we had a good run of things since we started in Next Wave in 2004. But the truth is that we're a tiny not-for-profit like many small arts orgs, we're completely dependent on year-to-year -year grant funding and the goodwill of the volunteers and the staff that, that care about us to run our two main events, which is Parallels and the main Free Play Festival. Especially after the lockdown years, I know that we are not the only 
games or arts workers who we were just feeling a little bit burnt out and not sure whether we could be sustainable for our community, but also for ourselves. Um, but our review showed that so many of you still firmly believe there's something really special about free play and our purpose to platform and champion artistic exploration and experimentation in games and play and position games making as more than just commercial, but as an arts practice. So thank you. We're working really, really hard um, with Kate Larson, who's our independent reviewer, and um, to build a better model for free play. And if you'd like to be part of this, because I've given it such a great spiel, um, we're currently looking for new voices on our board and a new community advisory group that we've started. So check out the Get Involved section of our website. OK, I want to recognize the super hard work of Paper House, who stepped in to make sure we could still do parallels this year. Honestly, if Terry and Sam, Cole, Jack, Andrew Gleason, Jared, Izzy, the rest of the supporting team, if you hadn't stepped up, we wouldn't have a parallels this year because we were so busy running the review. So thank you so much. Um, also, I want to shout out the people who put their heart and souls into running free play the last couple of years. No one would have faulted you for just canceling the whole thing. Um, but you pushed through and you kept it alive. The free play zone was really, really special for those of you who joined us there. Yeah, really good. So good. Um, and I know that the reason that you did it was not, you know, the amazing money you're getting from free play, but really the desire to keep giving new voices a, a platform, which is which is what we all believe in. So Chad, Ginny, Ben, Pritika, Goldie, Sherry, uh, Cecile and Jay, Tiara, anyone else that I've missed, just please give it up for the free play team from the last couple of years. Thank you. And then finally, and I promise I'll shut up and let it go on, the volunteer run board of free play, Believe me, nobody wants to run an organizational review during a pandemic. Nobody wants to do that. So thank you for giving so generously of your time and love. Alice, Dan, Doug, Georgia, Helen, Jason, Travis, and our free play babies who were born uh, during the pandemic, Harriet and Tom. Thank you. I won't hold you up any longer. Everyone, welcome to Parallels 2022. Thank you. Oh my gosh, this is why I got Claire up. I knew that it would be so much better. Anyway, um, she's doing the rest of the, rest of the show tonight. Um, I think it's really important to point out that, that Free Play is a, a non-for-profit community-run organization. So literally everyone here is, is what keeps it alive. And you keep coming back every year, and we all know how important it is to, to support Free Play. We, everyone knows it, and I think we just need to do a big just massive round of applause, just literally for free play existing. That's great, I love that. Um, on the other side of that, I really, really want to personally thank all of the sponsors and supporters and the community partners that we've had that have also like quite literally kept this alive. Um, usually when I go to events like this and it gets to the sponsor bit, it always feels a bit weird, a bit naff, and you kind of, oh yeah, thanks for the logos or whatever. <laughs> but, but honestly, like, they're, they're all community members as well. And they all understand the importance of keeping free play alive and supporting everyone else here and all of the other developers as well. So I, I genuinely want to thank them all. Um, it just absolutely means the, the world to me that they're willing to like just dish out such a high level of support, just com you know completely on you know out of their back pocket. Like it's incredible. Um, so first off for that is is Vic Screen. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. Um, <laughs> they so they're our presenting partner this year, and the support that they've given us is just remarkable. We we I I don't know how many times I've had to thank them in my life already, but it's it's getting to at least a million. Um, and then obviously we're here in the wonderful RMIT um, building 80. So big shout out to RMIT for all their support. 
house house the boys um, where do you where do you start with them honestly thank you so much and two point congratulations on the noms and of course league of geeks who have just they're going to require all of us. We know it's going to happen. <laughs> they just the support that they give everyone in the industry is just remarkable. It's just words don't you know anyway. Uh, and Beethoven Dinosaur with their huge, huge uh, release this year have just stepped out of out of the shadows and just understand the importance of creating you know games with wonderful artistic merit, and they they've really helped. Um, keep this alive. And Massive Monster, who I don't even think are here because they're over getting the after party organized, which we'll get on that later. Um, that's that's huge and that's that's amazing. Uh, and then a big shout out to Indigitech and Girl Geek Academy for also just being able to... <laughs> um, the, the community support is just absolutely amazing. and. You know, it's not it's not just money and things like that 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 help support organisations and event like this. It's, it's it comes from a lot of heart and a lot of just rallying community. And so, you know, can't thank them enough. Um, but what I'll do is we're going to get this started because we're already running a little bit late. Um, not that we've got anywhere to be. Well, we do. We get kicked out of here at nine. Uh, that's not true. That's not true. Okay, um, so our first presentation tonight uh, is Ian and Kalonika from Shape Shop. Um, they're going first literally because the game they're pre presenting is called Mars First, and for no other reason. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm just going to get started. I, I honestly, I just want to see what they've got. And we're just running a bit late, so I'm actually going to just, that's the intro. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry, but I want to get it going. I want to get into it. So let's give a round of It's really nice to be back at. Um... Yeah, I've got to say, I can hear. They can hear me. Yeah, um, so I actually presented at the first um, uh, two parallels um, in a small little room in Acme. Um, and um, one of the games that I showed was this one here on the screen there. In the, on the screen in the screen, um, which is called Vertex Meadow, which is a a tool for building uh, 3D landscapes out of 2D uh, images. And there was something really exciting to me about being able to um, so easily render, create these 3D worlds and explore them. And I think it triggered a, an ongoing interest in computer-generated landscapes for me. And the next um, game that I made sort of exploring this theme was called The Road That May Lead Nowhere, which actually driving down this infinite um, highway through computer generated terrain. Um, um, yep. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, one of, so one of the things that um, I liked about that game is it kind of captured the thing I love about road trips where the, you're kind of moving through the terrain and it's just sort of gradually changing around you as you move through it. Um, next came um, a game called Red Desert Render, um, which gives you a vast wilderness to explore and interrogate. And this was actually inspired by um, playing Red Dead Redemption 2 online um, with some friends, um, one of which was Kalonika. Um, and we explored far beyond the bounds of the play-designated area in the game. 
um, to areas where the terrain would take on these strange geometric um, forms and cracks would appear. Um, and you could see like that, you could see the ocean, this massive ocean underneath the whole map. And I became really interested in this mix of these um, strange geometric um, artificial shapes and this very natural um, lighting and environment. Um, so this game was the attempt to kind of replicate that. And the, um, okay. um, the um, so the techniques I've been using to generate these landscapes um, um, kind of increased in, in sophistication with that game. Um, and I wanted to develop them further. And I was really interested in making a game where the, the landscape itself was uh, a central character in the game. Um, and so I started thinking about what would be an interesting way to traverse the landscape. Um, and that's where the idea for um, this game, Mars First Logistics, came from. Um, so what Mars First Logistics is, um, is you're building um, these physically simulated um, vehicles out of Lego-like blocks, and then using them to transport cargo across the surface of Mars. And I think, I think what, whenever, what appeals to, to most people when they see the game is the building and the physics and all the kind of creative possibilities that that, that entails. But what actually came first was the landscapes and then everything else followed from that. Um, so having computer generated landscapes um, kind of changes the way that the game is made. So it becomes more about um, exploring the landscape and scouting out for good locations um, to put things than actually just designing everything from scratch. And I think it's a really kind of enjoyable way to, for me to um, make a game. And I, I really just enjoy like driving around and exploring the terrain. Um, so the terrain um, in this game has to do quite a lot of heavy lifting because uh, Mars is just a big desert. Um, and so you don't have a lot of variables that you can play with to add variety. You don't have grass or trees or anything like that. Um, so I put a lot of effort into kind of trying to create variety um, in, the, in the landscapes that I'm generating, um, both uh, visually but also from a gameplay point of view so that one, one moment you're driving over, you know, a big plane, uh, ramping over dunes, and then the next moment you might be trying to navigate through a, a treacherous um, canyon um, like this one here. Um, yeah, and so I've been working on the game on and off since um, 2020 and full time since the beginning of this year. Um, and Kalonika joined me um, in April of this year, and she's contributed enormously to the game's um, personality and charm. Um, and she's going to talk about um, her process uh, and what the game is to play. Earlier this year, Ian asked me to join him and make 3D art. Um, although the game already had a strong visual style, it took a while to settle in and sort out a pipeline that worked with his special shader. But once we worked that out, it was an easy job for me. I feel like I can put any um, 3D asset in this game and it will look good. The first assets I made were the stations. While making them, I've been trying to think in a similar way to the vehicles, where each building is loosely made of modular pieces similar to Lego. And every time I make something new, I try to think of it as adding a new piece to a collection of shapes to choose from. A shape shop, if you will. I feel the strong visual treatment has also given me permission to just lean into a somewhat stereotypical sci-fi aesthetic of simple shapes covered in meaningless pipes, panels, and buttons. We looked at Tim Tim a lot for inspiration, a tactile retro vibe that's more physical than digital, and I'm looking forward to exploring that further. I also made our little astronauts. To be honest, it was a... <laughs> It was a surprise when Ian asked me to make the characters for this game. 
because the early prototypes uh, gave the impression of a somewhat serious physics simulator. But when Ian made a watering can as one of the parcels to deliver, I think the tone of the game shifted a bit. Um, and I wanted the astronauts to encourage that vibe. I started by looking at the Tintin comic Explorers on the Moon, and the spacesuits in that are perfect, so I basically just copied them. Uh, and I also looked at old metal diving suits. Uh, I love how silly and low-tech and cumbersome they can look, and that the diver can only see out the small porthole. Uh, and I especially love how helpless they look. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I wanted the astronauts to feel a bit childish and lighthearted, like they're your peers, not your overlords, and a bit like lemmings, a little silly but not too stupid. And they're very busy, there's lots of work to do. I'm really enjoying exploring this touch of whimsy that has slowly started to reveal itself. It's really nice how it disarms the sci-fi, physics, engineering side of the game, and asks you not to think about it too hard. Like, how would a watering can work on Mars? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's also just fun. I'd made the construction site and even asked for somewhere for the workers to sit and eat the oranges you deliver, which makes sense. Uh, and, well, they probably want a cuppa on their break too, so I added some little bugs. Just don't think too hard about the consequences. Um, my favorite has been Ian coming into work he came into work one day <laughs> after thinking about his real home and saying he'd been wondering how the astronauts clean their suits and that there should definitely be a little clothesline in the game for them to cover their spacesuits up to dry. It's just nice not having to take it too seriously. When you're asked to speak at Parallels, you're encouraged to talk about why your game is meaningful to you. I had a big think about what makes this project meaningful to me, and honestly, it's that I get to work with my friend Ian. <laughs> Whenever anyone asks how it's going, I often just talk about how straightforward it all is, and that's really important to me. Ian always has such clarity to his work, and always seems to just go with the first solution that comes to mind, so I've been using that as permission to try and take the same approach. Like with the astronauts, I didn't feel the need to draw every single possible spacesuit design. I just drew one, showed it to Ian, he liked it, and that's what it is. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> I think it's partly that we've both had the privilege and experience of working on very many projects. And to echo a similar sentiment I had last time I spoke at Parallels, that allows us to trust our instincts and trust each other, trust that we know what we're doing and that it doesn't need to be any harder or bigger or more meaningful or complicated than it needs to be. What if making the games is fun? <laughs> It almost feels like cheating, it's all so straightforward. We both have such a clear idea of what this game is. It's like it already exists, and it's such a pleasure to feel like we just need to work to reveal it. Oh. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree that the game feels like it's basically making itself, and it's, it's really amazing to be working on something that um, kind of knows what it wants to be. And I think we both just are just happy to let it be whatever um, what it wants to be. So uh, thank you. How about that, everyone? <laughs> Incredible. I love that game so much. It's just been amazing to see how relaxed Ian and Kalonika are making it. I uh, can't relate to that at all. <laughs> but it's, it's amazing. And it's, it's just testament to them as game makers. It honestly is. Um, so moving on, we're on to the next group, which is very exciting.
Um, we've got the Guck team. So we. <laughs> do you want to do your own intro, or do you want to give a little? <laughs> oh, you will give us Kate. Everyone, Guck. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Katie and this is Elijah um, and we're from Guck. Um, we're going to give a cool and interesting talk today. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'd love to start out by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land which we work on and also the land which we're meeting on here today. Um, we'd also love everyone here um, who's non-Indigenous um, to look up something called Pay the Rent. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so welcome to our talk. It's uh, called Beyond Optics. So I'm uh, one of the game designers, programmer and 3D artist for our project Future Folklore. And uh, well, Katie's already introduced herself, but she's also the game runner for our project. Um, we just want to lighten the mood before we start. <laughs> it's a cool classic from 2018, but it's a tale as old as time. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, so we're actually presenting about a game. Um, what is the game, Eli? Um, so Future Folklore is um, Australia's first ever Aboriginal-led mobile game. Um, so Future Folklore's uniquely Indigenous lens invites players to restore the bush and care for country in a futuristic fantasy setting that's inspired by the Australian bush. So um, when, <laughs> we're not like other girls. <laughs> um, so our project, it started off growing organically from a collaborative First Peoples founded tech project. And that slowly evolved over the past few years into what is now becoming future folklore. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, this project didn't start by non-Indigenous people wanting to like tokenistically or paternalistically uh, hire black people to just make a game with Aboriginal stuff in it or whatever, which, I don't know, something. <laughs> oh yeah, um, so what does Aboriginal-led mean? Ding. We need to read off the paper, yeah. So every aspect of Future Folklore, the game and the project, is led and managed by First Nations people. This is including the art, design, development, marketing and operations. First Nations people hold meaningful positions of power over every aspect of the game. The project is accountable to a board, the Black Cloud Board, that is made up of 100% Aboriginal women leaders. The Black Cloud Board has full strategic, operational and financial oversight on this project. So the player that we're targeting for uh, our game isn't just any white person. It's primarily uh, made for Aboriginal people and especially younger Aboriginal people. Um, it's a game that's been created in a culturally safe uh, workplace where things like ICIP, uh, and if you don't know what that is, we'll be talking about that in a little bit, uh, are taken seriously. The game's not made for educational purposes, nor are First Nations people expected to pander to non-Indigenous audiences. And an Aboriginal-led project means there are ways of knowing, working and relating that are unique to First Nations people. These modes and processes exist outside of capitalism that can't and won't be reduced to viral tweets or marketing content. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so starting with placemaking, that is the framework you have to use because there's no disconnection between uh, the land and the people. Uh, yeah. So one of the things we do at GUC is um, we actually go out on country all the time. We do lots of field trips and study trips. Um, we go out on the country that people on the team are connected to. Um, we meet with caretakers, we do lots of learning. Um, and yeah, and we make sure that we're creating and contributing to ongoing connections to the land that we're drawing the inspiration from. And this is just like a weird photo of us camping <laughs> six hours away. <laughs> Looks like nothing, but it's really cool. Oh, oh I have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so processes. Um, what are some of the processes and what are the considerations when creating them? So we have a lot of stuff that we do that's really special and we're not able to share all of it. So we've spent a lot of time figuring out what we can present today. Um, one thing we wanted to say at the start is, is obviously Indigenous culture and language isn't homogenous. So considerations should be made for all First Nations people. We need to be ensuring that we collaborate and consult one another. Oh, this is spoken in the. Yeah. This is working in the wrong tense. <laughs> That's your thing. You need to read that. Okay. <laughs> That's me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So ensuring we all collaborate and consult with one another, as many of the First Nations members are from different nations and regions, uh, and so different things will have different meanings for them and their people. So like myself, I'm a Noongar person from Perth and you know I'm working over here in Melbourne and a lot of the members on our team are from around here and other parts of Australia. So those are things that we do have to consider when we're designing the game and creating the story, etc. Um, and yeah, so having more senior Aboriginal people on the team means when it comes to doing these things like designing our games and our story and our law, uh, we always have someone that we can go to and ask for guidance and feedback on anything that we create. Um, so, um, yeah, we design a bit differently. So we, um, Strap in for this, okay? Yeah, a few slides here, so you know, bear with me. Um, we think about whose land we are on. We acknowledge that country in practice rather than just saying it. For example, our game contains uh, plants and animals inspired by the bush, uh, but because we're on Bunurung and Wurundjeri land, Kulin Nations, we uh, work from a framework of Kulin Nations and Kuri peoples uh, knowledges first. So this also involves uh, working under a, a matriarchal kind of system because uh, over here, women are more in charge of everything. So uh, yeah, um, so this is how we like do place. We don't just draw random gum trees that someone pulled off of Pinterest or whatever. Um, we, we actually have like processes in a way that Everything is created, which aligns with an acknowledgement of the country and the people and the um, unbroken connections between them and how our country is communicated. Um, so the first plants that we made were designed around and inspired by the things that grow here in Bunurong country uh, with art direction from traditional owner and our art director at GUC, Jara Carolina Steele. Um, starting there initially and working outwards, we begin to encompass more Kulin Nations and other members of our team. After Kulin Nations have been recognised, we continue to expand with our connections. So these are all kind of the different countries that we, the members on our team have connection to. And uh, yeah. Yeah, just some of them, not everything, because there's a lot. Yeah. Everyone's voices are important and equal. Community processes are different from traditional games processes. Um, we need to consider 
that you have to consult, collaborate and compensate community for their time and knowledge when you're working on projects that includes anything to do with First Nations people. Um, so connecting includes acknowledging the creatives, writers, technologists and leaders who came before us who created trailblazing work. Uh, we work on building strong and meaningful uh, connections to our references. For example, our game is heavily inspired inspired by a uh, Yorda Yorda man, Lynn Onus and his works, and we've gotten uh, the consent and blessing of his family to actually use his work as inspiration for the game and all the artwork in it. Um, yeah, so we uh, focus also on sustainability of uh, the community and the people who we work with, especially the members on our team. So uh, we prioritize investing in skills and development um, and setting up like First Nations practitioners to become leaders in their fields. Uh, yeah, so the games industry is rife with ICIP theft and exploitation of First Nations people, unfortunately. Um, feel free to pull out your phones for the next slide and then you can um, try reading this at home. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to try and go through it really quickly. You need to learn what ICIP is. ICIP stands for Indigenous Cultural Intellectual Property. There are laws in Australia that protect Indigenous communities and cultures from being stolen from by people such as yourselves. Okay, Terry Jenke's Pathway and Protocols to Indigenous Engagement, it's available via Screen Australia. There's one for OZCO. I'm sure there's going to be one for games soon, but it's, it's very transferable. You can download it. It's totally free. You need to read it. Um, <laughs> Terry Janke also runs courses um, called True Tracks, where you can do like a little workshop and learn about ICIP. If you're not Indigenous, you really need to learn about this. Um, I'd say that's point one, two, three. Point four, cultural consulting. Do you have an idea where you want to Aboriginalize your game? Are you looking for a young Aboriginal person that you can pay $20 an hour cash to, to just steal some crap? <laughs> Go <laughs> you <laughs> off a <laughs> Okay. Um, cultural consulting actually doesn't cost $20 an hour. It costs thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a day. If you had any ties to any community at all, you would know that. So before you start thinking that you'll be able to leverage culture into a commercial project, please do your research and make sure you have the money to compensate people because what you're doing is you're taking intellectual property and you're trying to sell it. So can you afford the license for that? Same as you license whatever bullshit Disney IP, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, this is super important. Like we're really grateful that we've been able to share this basically. <laughs> um, be mindful of labels. Um, a project is not an Indigenous game if there's no senior Aboriginal people in positions of power or leadership with oversight on financial, operational and creative aspects of the project, especially if there's no revenue share with First Nations stakeholders. How is something an Indigenous game if it's not led, owned and financially coming back into the community? Please start recognizing and hiring people for their talent and their skills, not just their identity. Stop assuming that First Nations game devs can only be hired to contribute to your project when it's about their culture and their identity. Aboriginal devs are artists, developers, writers and designers just like everybody else. And they have a vast array of interests and aesthetics and they don't need to be pigeonholed. It's extremely career limiting for people. Please educate yourself on self-determination. 
Be open to feedback and willing to change. Life is a learning journey. Let's keep learning, pay the rent. And lastly, <laughs> please stop behaving like it should be a media spectacle and that you deserve a good ally award just for hiring a black person. We do not like seeing media articles where someone is being celebrated for hiring a token black person. The underlying principle at GARC is that representation, diversity, and inclusion without justice is just optics. Lastly, <laughs> we just want to say thank you because it is a bit of a harsh ending, but it needs to be said. Um, firstly, thank you to Terry and Paper House because we basically have a no talks policy. Um, we're asked to give talks constantly like every week or something and Terry has gone out of his way for like a year or something being like please please give a talk um he really hustled to get us here today so thank you Terry for putting in the work because it wasn't just like an offer for us we don't care um and thank you to Indigitex logo is missing here I'm sorry Ben but thank you to our partners at Indigitech and Black Cloud and our supportive funders at Vic Screen and Screen Australia who totally back all our hardline staunch ideas and ways of working. I guess I just say one want to say uh, thanks for having us here and um, I don't know, maybe I'll see you at PAX or something. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for that uh, incredible presentation from Guck. Um, hi everyone, I'm Sam uh, from Paper House and I have the pleasure of introducing our next speakers, which is Jess and Darcy from Studio Folly. Um, feel free to come up and get ready while I give your bio. Um, so Jess is the co-founder and creative director at Studio Folly. With a history in communication design and art direction, she spent over 10 years creating brands, print and digital design for businesses large and small. If you've walked through Melbourne, you've no doubt seen Jess's work on and within storefronts. And Darcy is the co-founder and game director at Studio Folly and a games lecturer at the Victorian College for the Arts. Um, Darcy has a passion for game design and specializes in games that make you think. Um, uh, Darcy is most known for his seven years at League of Geeks working on Armello. Please make them feel very welcome. I feel like our game feels very silly to like follow that talk up, but thank you for um, the talk and thank you for having us to Terry and Sam and Free Plan. It's uh, exciting to be here because this is sort of, I think our favorite event in games. everyone, thanks for having us. Um, we're really excited after two years of development and not many hours of sleep in the last week to finally show you our game, Govins. So, I'm Darcy. And I'm Jess. Um, and two years ago, uh, we were sort of in the throes of lockdown and we decided to make a silly decision to start a game dev studio together. Um, uh, I guess I had a history and a background and a passion for like all things sort of tabletop and strategy and board games. Uh, I sort of grew up playing Scrabble against my mum and now I play Dungeons and Dragons with my pals. Um, um, and I sort of have a obsession with typography and colour and I sort of found that my sort of taste in those things isn't hugely represented in games and so I thought um, making a word game together was a was a cool move. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. So um, we pulled together a team of people that have never touched a game before. So we've got Georgia Chris, who's a more traditional animator. She has a lot of more cartoon work, and we've got Zach Fay, who's a, a traditional illustrator. He's represented by the Jackie Winter Group, who are an amazing art agency that 
I've never touched a game before, but they happen to do about half of the storefront art for Apple. So we thought there was a great strategic match there. Um, and then uh, Katarzyna Wiktorski is our composer. Um, she's like a local traditional jazz musician. And in lockdown, um, between lockdown, I should say, uh, we recorded the music together in a little mud brick studio in Collingwood. Um, yeah, I guess we kind of had uh, a, stra a theory that games can be made by um, people that don't necessarily make them. Um, and this is, this is our trailer for our game. I hope you like it. is a little piece of art. <laughs> the it's a word game thing um, kind of came up as a joke, but it's sort of <clears throat> semi-inspired by um, superliminal messaging, like, jo hey, join the Navy, superliminal messaging. <laughs> um, and yeah, it sort of works. Yeah, um, so just to break down a tiny bit um, the gameplay of our game. So you basically grab tiles from the draw pile and you place them on the board and you drag to make words. But as you're going, little modifiers called gubbins will either help and hinder you as you're going. So perhaps um, you might have a pencil that acts like a blank Scrabble tile or a skateboard might smash into your word and, and muck it up. Um, yeah. Yeah, it kind of plays like uh, Solitaire meets Scrabble um, and sort of under the hood, it kind of functions like a roguelike. <laughs> it's true, the, the, the powers, it's just like Hades, can't you tell? Um, but it, it, the, each power up is a character and that was kind of like a cool pivotal moment in the game that sort of brought it to where it is um, today. Do you want to have? Oh yeah, this needs contextualization. That bit to be the, the gets the laugh. Um, do you want to tell them? Yeah, you can. Yeah, sure. So um, this is a recent addition to our game. Um, it's a share feature where at the end of the game, you get um, to make a postcard with the words you've made um, and put them into scenes where the butt of the joke is ready, waiting for you. Um, yeah, so you've got your gubbins, your words, and some other stickers, and you can kind of show off funny and silly and clever words that you've made and in jokes with your friends and yeah we're quite excited about it uh, we found that like as soon as we put this feature in the game it kind of fundamentally shifted the experience of playing the game away from sort of a, t a highly technical thing about trying to make the longest words and get the highest score and now you'll see something funny or interesting um, and you'll sort of strive to make that word to set up a joke, if you're like me. Um, but both are options. Um, but we wanted to talk a little bit more about um, what it's like to make a mobile game um, that is, I guess, hopefully meant to be somewhat commercially viable um, in the modern era, because it's a bit weird. Um, so we found that uh, when talking to any sort of partners, like publishers, investors, um, so, you know, storefronts, um, uh, subscription services, um, there's this uh, general consensus that the mobile industry has moved very quickly into this very specific place where um, dev times have never been lower. Um, the, the goal is to get to market and test the game, harvest data, obtain that data and say, we retain this amount of people, please. And then if you hit a good enough point, then people will just all sort of give you money. And that's a bit weird. 
um, there's sort of very few ethical standards about uh, monetization and the, the norms are quite strange. Like I, I think like we all heard about Diablo Immortal, like it's, it, it, I guess there's sort of like a villain class that's sitting in suits somewhere that are like totally stoked that the game costs like half a million dollars to beat. Um, and the, the general sort of like vibe around talking to people about how you make these games is they, it's basically anything goes, anything that you can get away with, you, you should get away with. Um, and that's weird. Um. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also there's like an incredibly flooded market. So it's like really scary because over 500 games per day are released um, as free to play um, and there's basically developers aren't just releasing one game necessarily. A lot of developers are making one game, skinning it 10 times and pushing all of these games at once to find out which actually has the most uh, retention and conversion. And that just means that like, if you open the app store right now, because of all the weird money and the weird games that are coming out at such a breakneck speed, you probably won't even recognize probably eight out of 10 uh, of the games and the, the top charts. So that's sort of like hard. And I guess we started making a mobile game because we thought it was the small way to go. And we found through the process of this, that it's absolutely not. And I guess we sort of have landed in a weird place where we're like, um, more, more or less people have told us to our faces that we might be making a mistake um, or that we basically just don't belong here. Um, and one person in particular that we, that we spoke to, <laughs> uh, which was, it was that I, I respect this person a lot. Um, but they did, you know, when I sort of expressed my grief over trying to make our game fit into sort of traditional standard or expected monetization models. And I think I said something about how ads are essentially attention vampirism. Um, he turned around and said, but Darcy, if you know, if you don't want to be here making mobile games, you may as well flip burgers. Like if you're not going to play the game, like literally go somewhere else. Um, and that's sort of unfortunate. Um, and after sort of being battered by that comment, we kind of, we did, we did try to conform to those norms. Like we did try and push our game in like, what does it look like if Govern's a premium or have a price or, you know, um, how, how, how does, how do in-app purchases work? And we played with that for a, a while. And then we had a really pivotal conversation with um, a friend of the studio, Morgan Jaffet. Uh, and Morgan is a lovely man. Uh, and he, I think very quickly saw right through us because we were sort of like, yeah, he was kind of like, so how do you plan on making cash and supporting your business? And we're like, oh, a bit of this and a bit of that and whatever. And I don't think we were really inspired. Um, and he was just like, why are you trying to pretend to be a shark when you're so clearly just an elegant little seahorse riding a current? And I, and I sort of felt like he was attacking. I was, I was maybe already bruised. So I was like, am I being attacked again? <laughs> uh, but I, it sort of became a bit of a mantra for us. Just like, you know, why, why not? Why can't we have our special little game? And why can't we be on our cool little current like an elegant little seahorse? Um, so I guess, what do we do about it? Like, where are we going and what does that mean for us? Um, so more or less, I think that Gubbins, as far as I'm concerned, isn't just a mobile game anymore, both just like practically and with our identity. Like, I think we want to do sort of a syndicated release across many platforms, even if it's unconventional, because it's what we're passionate about. Um, and I, I guess we uh, encourage you to keep, you know, writing your current, finding your current and feel like, you know, figure out what, how you like to work and um, how you like to make things um, and become your, your true seahorse. Um, and, you know, although we're like a bit unsure about how our, what we make fits into the industry, we have zero doubts about how we make things and the quality of our work. Um, 
Um, and even if Govern shakes out to not be a commercial success, um, at least we will fail on our own terms. So. Wow, thanks so much to Darcy and Jess. Um, we are very looking forward to playing that game. Um, so up next, we have Ben and Ricky from 2PM Studio. Um, oh, great. Uh, ben is a programmer, designer, and artist who's been making cool stuff with computers for over 20 years. His experience spans systems architecture, UI, UX design, geospatial mapping, VR training, and generative art, but games are where it all started. And Ricky is a game designer, creative director, writer, narrative, and level designer, making games for almost 17 years, while his main role in Song of the Fae, which you will all see tonight, is mechanics and puzzle design. He also experiments with short stories, art games, and sometimes even a third thing. Please make them feel very welcome. Hello, uh, I'm just going to talk while Ben gets set up. Uh, it's lovely to be here with a bunch of other people who don't belong, uh, with people who are very passionate about their particular topics, and even some people from the third world of Queensland like ourselves. <laughs> uh, excited to hear from SBUG in the future. Uh, we're going to talk about Wizard Chess, uh, which we used to call Song of the Fae, and we'll talk a little bit about the reasons we don't call it that anymore. So I'm Ricky, I do the writing of the words and the designing of the levers, and Ben does the art and the code. Um, and we've been doing this for about 17 years, uh, across a, about a dozen different projects at this point for iOS and PC and web. Um, and, and yeah, we haven't stopped yet. Yeah, go for it. Cool, okay, we have something, nice. Uh, the culmination of our work is probably the Thin Silence, which some of you may know from previous free plays. We got honourable mentions. We never actually won anything, uh, which is a very hard game to define uh, and probably why I didn't win anything. Uh, it's a puzzle platformer game with a very extensive narrative revealed cinematic uh, storytelling experience. It's a walking simulator and a point and click adventure, but we didn't realise it was either of those things until about six months after it came out. <laughs> um, and it's the nudist colony of games. It's not for everyone, but a select few really enjoy it. Uh, so we got some very good reviews in that regard and, and plural people bought it, like more than one. Um, afterwards, it kind of left us thinking, where do we go from here? What's the next thing for the studio? We talked about banding like uh, spin-off sequels for some of the side characters, really just using the six year investment of technology and code based and narrative writing that we did for this. But then um, this guy had other ideas. Uh, so this is wizard chess. Uh, you are a narcissistic bard who's been magically kidnapped by the Fae, who are sort of all powerful beings running an eternal tournament of wizard chess. You have this army of misfits and ragtag warriors with their own weaknesses, feats and foibles. Uh, and you can, if you don't like them, you can get rid of them and replace them with something else. You can make them a little bit better along the way or just ditch them out altogether. Uh, your opponents are the Fae, basically all powerful deities with very limited social skills. Uh, you can sort of choose your own path through the game, but at the end you have to defeat them. Uh, and you do so with the aplomb that only amateur musicians have. Um, Wizard Chess is a lot of things that the Thin Science isn't. It's basically the opposite of it in many ways, the antithesis of the event. Uh, it shares no art assets, no technology, no conceptual design with the Thin Science. Uh, where the Thin Science is quiet and self-reflective, Wizard Chess is brash, bombastic, self-absorbed romp through a fantasy board game, uh, where we flaunt the rules of decorum and also game design. Uh, why? Because that's how we felt when the Thin Science came out, when we released it. Basically, uh, anything but this again. <laughs> and so that knee-jerk rejection of sort of the road most travelled led us to develop what we're calling the narrow path. And we totally didn't make that up just for the purposes of this talk. So I'm going to let Ben talk you through that. Cool. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Ben. I'm going to talk about the narrow path. Uh, Use the 
Yeah. Laptop. Yeah. Wrong mouse, too many mouse. Cool. So, uh, imagine you want to make a game. Uh, some of you might be able to imagine this. As you gaze out onto the landscape of all of the games that you could possibly make, there's one peak in the distance that stands out to you. At the summit is the game you want to make. A vision that you can see crystal clear, and you can almost make out the path that leads you all the way there, winding up the mountain. And yet, you know as soon as you start walking, you're going to be down behind the tree line and the, uh, navigating the forest of ideas with only the image of that mountain in your mind. So, to avoid getting lost, you're going to need to make a map, and you need to make it before you start. And if you think I'm about to talk about design documents, we didn't make one of those. We, uh, we threw a few landmarks down and we started walking. So what are the landmarks? The first landmark, Tafel. Tafel are a class of board games from ancient Nordic and Celtic culture. Uh, they take place on a checkered board like chess, but they predate chess. They're from the 12th century CE. Um, it differs from chess in two key ways. The first is the asymmetric board design. The white pieces are in the middle here defending the king. The black pieces are attacking and you have to get out. The second difference is that pieces are taken by flanking. So two black pieces have to flank a white piece to take it. The next landmark, roguelikes. A little known genre that we thought we might be able to resurrect. I'm sure you've never heard of them. <laughs> and thirdly, wizards. That's it. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, So these landmarks helped orient us. They show us what the shape of the game was going to be. And with just these few references, we actually had a pretty good idea of what we were trying to make. Uh, but we couldn't get started without actually beginning to walk that narrow path. And the first few steps are pretty easy when you start walking. You pick some tools, and you start trying to make a video game. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then you get uh, somewhere like this. You throw some units on a board, you make them move around. They can even attack each other. And this has the same mechanic as Taffel, where two units flanking another will take them. Uh, and this looks a lot like the game we have today, except that this clip is actually from two years ago. Uh, and so, see, at first, like, walking the path seems really easy. But then you get lost. <laughs> uh, and we got lost a few times. So. The first place we got lost was trying to work, go beyond the single room of wizard chess. What is this going to be? Well, it's going to be a D&D campaign where you play as a bard and you have a party full of units and you take them on an adventure and you go to all these taverns and you write an epic saga called The Song of the Fae. Uh, and we tried to get this funded and we couldn't because this is enormous and it doesn't actually like, become a real video game. That became apparent at some point. <laughs> And then we swung back the other way, and we were like, well, roguelikes, they have these maps where you pick between the couple different encounters, and you uh, have some options with shops and bosses. Let's do that. But when we started putting this in, we just felt like we'd lost the shape of the game, and the magic was sort of missing. And so the thing is, if we'd been funded for the Bard Simulator concept, or if we'd stuck with the simplest possible game, we would have lost the narrow path to what Wizard Chess has become today. And looking out at the landscape, it's easy to lean too far to the left, and your science-based dragon breeding MMO never quite takes shape. But it's just as easy to swing back to the right. And in the process of carving out a concrete game, you can cut out the very heart of what you're trying to do. And knowing this, it can be hard to even take that first step. If step in the wrong direction, though, it doesn't actually matter if the destination remains unchanged. You need to stop and reorient yourself. You have to look at your map and figure out how you get from here to there. You need to make 3,770 cards in Miro and hit the usage limit, and in Figma, and in Slack, and you maybe need to consider paying for your tools at some point. <laughs> See, uh, is this it? Yeah. You went past my slide. Oh, no. Yeah. Sometimes you have to go pretty far down the wrong path to know that it's the wrong way. And our pursuit of the narrow path of wizard chess has taken us down the scenic route. Almost all the things you see here were perfectly functional games. None of them are the game now. Uh, we had to find that out by making them. Some of these were tempting to pursue, especially with the lure of actual funding. But they were not the path to wizard chess. They led to different mountains. So, to find the specific game that we are now very proud of, we had to spend a lot more time than was strictly necessary. Is this stupid? Like, maybe it is, but... Uh, in an effort to like stay afloat in the insanely competitive current industry, it is tempting to tightly budget and scope every action and uh, decision you make in the game. But we wanted to find something truly interesting to us and follow it to its conclusion. I think we have a lot of advantages that other people don't have. We're fortunate to not be beholden to the obligations, financial, professional, reputational. 
Uh, we aren't making income from our games. Both of us have other jobs. We are hobbyists. Um, we try to be an archetype of a different type of indie studio. And because we're from Queensland, no one knows who we are. I mean, we've been doing this <laughs> for 17 years. And as soon as we leave Melbourne, you guys will forget us like a dream upon waking. <laughs> Uh, but that actually works in our favour. Uh, these obligations distort the shape of the game you can make. They limit how far you can walk and which mountains you can climb. And if you let them, they'll limit how far you can see. To quote the wizard Erskine, to walk the narrow path is to ask yourself what your purpose is, not only in the moment, but as far as your mage sight can see. Uh, so thanks for listening to our talk about wizard chess. Uh, Thank you both. Um, we won't forget you. Um, there's, there's a lot of people. Whoa. Um, what's up? I'm Jared from Paper House. People, stragglers, go. There's chairs at the back. Quick. Um, I'm here to present the next group, which is Pink Clouds. Uh, Little Pink Clouds, actually. Little Pink Clouds is a fledgling indie game studio from Melbourne. The studio began with a small group of friends uh, who decided to make a game together in 2020. They have now grown to a group of nine developing their first title, Letters to Arala. I want to make the butt joke. The team loves making games with buttloads of charm, as you'll see. Um, character and cuteness. So I'll hand the mic to Chantel. Thank you so much, Jared. You just heard the wonderful and whimsical music that plays all over Rala Isle by composer Dana Yun. Hello and welcome to the Isle. I'm Chantel. I'm Ali. Hello friends, I'm Nat. And we are working on Letters to Arala, a cute little game about delivering letters on a small fictional island inspired by Australia. We began this project in 2020 and have grown from a small team of three to 10 close friends working together in bringing this game to life. We wanted to make a game that was equal parts wholesome, silly, and escapist. And only now have we come to admit that this game was absolutely a response to being stuck at home for two years. We wanted to create our own little summer holiday in a world we could explore and enjoy. To be completely honest, we didn't know exactly what we were making two years ago. All we knew is that we wanted to make something full of heart. We had a loose idea for what the game would be, what you could do, and how it all ends. So in the middle of summer, stuck at home, I feverishly began creating pieces of concept art. A part of me believed that I didn't need to create any more concept art because it was all up here in my brain. It'll turn out fine. I was itching to start 3D modeling and to build this world. <laughs> because of this... Sorry. Because of this, our old environments literally looked like unpopulated landscapes from GTA. For the arrival of our amazing technical artist, Mickey Kreckelberg, who thankfully turned the ship around. This is absolutely a real screen cap from our game that I didn't edit at all whatsoever. Wink. We were able to move away from our beloved GTA aesthetics to something much cuter and wombier by creating a much needed style guide. This helped us understand the desired feel we wanted for our game and how we needed to design our assets more consciously. Everything that I modeled before the style guide was completely remade to match our clearer art direction. Even though I learned a lot during this phase, I had to spend months rebuilding everything on, on the island. Every tree, every bush, every building. It took a lot of time. The style guide absolutely should have been made at the very beginning of our process, but better late than never. Moral of story, things with round edges look cuter. <laughs> What began as scribblings in Photoshop, where, where I excitedly constructed this island, has turned into what we're going to present for you all tonight. All right. <laughs> we hope you like sitting down and looking at things, because we're going on a tour, everybody. <laughs> We'd like you to meet our very good friend, Tanned Cucumbra. 
When he's not pickling in the sun, he gives curated tours of Rala Isla. Isle. Tonight, he's organized a special tour for his guests from the Parallels Universe. Wink. <laughs> Cucumbra and the other residents have recently welcomed a new male turnip. Yeah. To the esteemed postal service, as shown by our hats. This is a very unique delivery system used only on Arala, where residents use pictures to show the letter destinations instead of addresses. It's also entirely common for mail to be received with the seal unbroken, but that's just a regular part of the postal process and everybody has the utmost trust in the work done by posties. The mail turnip may read your mail, but they'll also help you out with whatever might be troubling you in life. The residents living on the island love this unique delivery system. Neighbors will send letters to each other, willing to wait days just to hear back from their buddy next door. <laughs> the new male turnip is still learning this special system, but they don't mind, because they're getting paid. <laughs> the architecture on Ar Arala is a mixture of new and old. In an attempt to accommodate for the many holiday goers on Arala, uh, a theme, uh, themed Clover Motel was built in the 70s by renowned architect Bailey Morganson. Uh, wait, Morganson, Morganson. Along with a more recent stylish outdoor pub extension to welcome everyone to our little slice of paradise. One of Cucumbra's favorite buildings is the town hall. Not only is it his favorite color, the color of sand, he's best friends with the island's mayor, Alphanta the only resident who has run unopposed for the position seven years straight. There are many strange phenomenons that tourists point out to Cucumbra uh, on his tours, such as the convenient speech bubbles that appear over the heads of everyone on the island when they speak. Not to mention the mysterious and ever useful mailbags of Arla's postal workers that can fit impossibly large amounts of letters created by physics-defying engineer Rhiannon Ross and allow for parcels to be readily inspected for speedy delivery. We all love it when people show us their holiday photos, especially when we went there to experience it. On rare occasions, uh, completely undamaged and ready to use cameras uh, wash up on our shores, another one of our strange phenomenons. If you're lucky enough to find one, uh, you can take your own holiday photos to show your friends and family back home. Cucumbra also loves long walks on the beach, uh, but he also loves long walks around the island's nature paths. Around him are many as iconic Australian plants, such as fern trees, cushion bushes, uh, wandari wattles, blue agapanthus, and white gums. Sometimes he wonders how so many plants from different Australian ecosystems all seem to appear in one compact place. Who put them here? Why do some of them look identical? Wait, is the bottom of that one transparent? He doesn't think too hard on such complex universal questions. <laughs> he simply enjoys the little microcosm he can stroll around in. On the way to the beach, there are many local activities for residents to enjoy. The gazebo near the island's waterfall is a sight to behold. There is a relaxing overlook equipped with binoculars to view the distant mainland. And every morning, the new delivery turnip will destroy the public chessboard. <laughs> Cucumbra? <laughs> Cucumbra has no choice but to witness the daily wreckage. <laughs> also... <laughs> We'll get to that. <laughs> also on the overlook is a newly installed infographic, which residents and visitors can read to learn about the island's creation story. Broken into three parts, renowned storyteller Phoebe Watson describes how two entities roamed the world and fell asleep somewhere on the island. Cucumbra has signed a position, petition to install more of these stories around the island, supported by the island mayor and community. Residents want new infographics made for the Misty Mountains and South Beach, enriching the natural beauty of these locations. Cucumber notices how the, del the delivery turnip has stopped to enjoy the story, whilst also keeping a vigilant eye on them. <laughs> Look, I said we'd get to it. I said we'd get to it. <laughs> Cucumbra just realized that his back was facing you moments ago and that you may have unintentionally stared at his well-sculpted butt. But don't worry, he's very used to it and wanted to clarify to everyone from the Parallels universe 
that residents on this island do indeed have their butts out all the time. <laughs> he hopes that you can accept this little quirk about their island. Oh, I hope that I don't think the sound's going to play. <laughs> oh, maybe if I hit the button. Anyway, Cucumber has more than just one best friend, though. He recently met local audio design whiz Ben Houghton, who it brought exciting sounds to the island. There were no sounds on our aisle until Ben came along. Now Cucumber can enjoy the laugh of kookaburras, the crunch of sand beneath, beneath his cucumber feet. However, those no noisy cicadas that drone at sunset give him a headache. Thanks a lot, Ben. <laughs> Cucumber has actually made a lot of friends from the Parallels universe, 10 in fact. He can keep track of all of these friends via these colorful squares, lovingly designed by our marketing designer, Monica Keeler. These squares help him recall who's who because sometimes it's hard for him to tell our fleshy faces apart. He's trying his best. Cucumber had no idea so many people were helping to make Arala Isle the best it can be. Thank you for joining Cucumbra on this guided tour around the island. He hopes you've enjoyed this little glimpse into his world and wishes to see you as a visitor there soon. Apparently it's me. Hello again. Uh, thank you very much for speaking, Chantel and the team. Uh, speaking up next will be Bits and Bops, Tempo Lab. Oh, yes? No? Do I have the order wrong? S-Bug, S which is Terry. Anyway, I'm going to introduce you. That's fine. So our next presenters are Spug, uh, Riley and Noah. Spug, Spug, I'm pronouncing it wrong. One word. Spug is a tiny studio from Queensland making games about their tiny local wildlife. Riley and Noah released their debut game, Webbed, in 2021, and are now working <laughs> and are now working on a follow-up about an adorable little isopod, uh, which they'll be talking about today. So make them feel welcome. Thank you. Hello. I'm just trying to find the PowerPoint. Hi. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, I'm, I'm Riley. I'm the director, artist, and bug designer at Spug. I'm Noah. I'm a designer. I make noises, and I'm a bug enthusiast. And uh, about a year ago, we released our first game, Webbed. Um, um, so, um, Webbed went uh, incredible, way better than we could have ever expected. Um, and we wanted to make more, and people wanted more. Uh, but we were kind of running up against the roof of what we could do with Game Maker. It's kind of a miracle that Webbed runs on Switch, so... Yeah, we, we did things with physics we never should have attempted. <laughs> um, so we wanted to make a second Webbed, basically. Yeah. Uh, and we wanted to look into a more powerful engine, into uh, Web. Currently learning and making a game in Unreal Engine, but we thought we'd start a little smaller first. Thought. Keyword thought. Yeah. Um, so we spent, we, we decided we needed to learn the engine quick and quick as possible. So we thought we'd make uh, a game a week. For a prototype a week. For a prototype a week. Um, it was heavy air quotes on the week as it turned out. Um, so we had a channel in our little discord of uh, just throwing ideas uh, for these games every week. And the first idea, the first idea was this, this picture by the excellent uh, app. <laughs> A Bedu Polka on Twitter, or currently known as the uh, president of the iSpot fan club, made this amazing comic, um, which we just I, I just thought was fantastic. And this this remains the only thing in that ideas chat. Um, <laughs> so we spent about a week, well, 
You started a week early. I started the week before the first week we were supposed to be doing a game a week. Uh, and I learned how to do like procedural animation in 3D because in the past I'd been doing it all in 2D. And I didn't want to learn how to actually animate the proper way, keyframes and like animation. Uh, so I spent a week learning how to do procedural animation. And I made a little isopod. Um, and then no, oh, and then I came in, did a bit of level stuff as I bashed my way through Unreal, trying to unlearn Unity stuff, which was a nightmare for me. But um, we were convinced we were going to spend a week on it. A week on each of these ideas. So, so then came next week, and we started something else. Yep. And then about three days later, we stopped and came back to this. Yeah. And kept working on this for like five months now. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then it turned into? This is, this is Isopod. It's... <laughs> it, is, it is not yet the full sequel to Webbed that we want to make eventually, but it is a Webbed story. And we're going to show you a little bit of it today. Yes, but before we start, a uh, really heavy arachnophobia warning. Uh, we haven't added the blob mode yet, and unlike Buddy, our precious spider from Webbed, this next spider that will be showing up very soon is very spider-like. Um, does have a hat, though. Does have an amazing hat. <laughs> uh, and so just if you, if you want to step out for a moment or just close your eyes or turn away, we'll give you a note when you can come back. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's fine. Uh, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, all right. Okay, so so this here is is the trapdoor spider. Um, I say the trapdoor spider because there is one trapdoor spider in the world of webbed, and all of the various trapdoors uh, lead back to his burrow. Uh, here's the fast travel mechanic that we have that we are building into this game, and he's also kind of a soft antagonist. He summoned you here to help deal with the fire ant problem because he thinks you're an armadillo. <laughs> you are actually an uh, armadillo de vulgare, which is the common woodlouse, um, but he doesn't seem to believe you. So as a woodlouse, uh, you can kind of walk around. You can roll into a ball. Show us what we're rolling into a ball. Yeah. And, and rolling into a ball lets you fly around the place and just explore. Um, go, go eat some leaves. Yeah, so uh, isopods are known for rolling into balls, eating leaves, and removing heavy metals from the soil. Uh, we have the rolling into balls and le eating leaves so far. Uh, heavy metals from the soil is coming soon, but we haven't quite got that yet. Um, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> uh, so this is Tinker. Tinker is your new best friend. Um, she has been separated from the rest of her ant colony. She is not a fire ant. She is a friendly bull ant. Uh, and she is an inventor and needs help finding tools uh, for her to build her inventions. So uh, she said one of them was in this tree. We may have to skip this tree be because it's very difficult, but I'll let you give it a shot first. I'll give it another shot. I swear I'm good at this game. Yeah. <laughs> Let's climb in a little bit. Oh. Oh. oh, hang on. We forgot to say we can you can come back in the room if you. Oh yeah, spiders. yeah. The, I keep the forgetting spider to ended ages ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just a little more. <laughs> okay, if you fail from here, we're moving on. Okay. No pressure. Sure, no pressure. You can do it. I won't roll. I won't roll. Yeah, it's just gonna roll. <laughs> Rolling does make it much more likely for you to fall off narrow platforms like this. It's, it's game design, actually. <laughs> Don't get distracted talking. Yeah. That's the key part of playing this game. Okay. Short hop. Oh, oh, oh. Short hop. All right. Yep. Yeah. 
I'm going to skip that one. Yeah. Oh. Speed run. Yeah, speed run. We, do, it, we got. We got. We haven't got so much time. Okay. Now okay. for the ramp jump. Ramp jump. Oh boy. Here we go. Is this what? being a twist? I picked up the tool. So, okay, that's first hand tool. All right. Uh, I didn't make it. You missed the jump. That's okay. And we've got two more to go. Yeah. Just quickly. Speed run. I can do the rest real quick. Yeah, go as fast as you can. We're using the uh, Sonic the Hedgehog music start now. I just realized there's no sound yeah, playing sound through this. Yeah, coming out, but it's fine. Imagine some really nice music by our composer, uh, Stan Van Wackeren, which isn't playing. And also very cool crunchy leap sounds whenever you roll through a leaf to absorb it. Oh. <laughs> So there's a lot of wall jumping here. Oh, we got sound. Hey. Hey. Can we turn that up a little? Uh, it's like too many keys. It's fine. Yeah. Oh yeah. The excellent tippy taps. All right. Here is another tool. That's definitely a tool, and not a. It's not a chicken drum drumstick. I swear. Yeah. It's like a rock with a handle. I think. Big jump coming up. Gotta have the speed. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Playing alive. This is stressful. Mm -hmm. You're doing great so far, Noah. You haven't fallen once. I'm shocked. Did you? There's a little staircase. It's fine. Uh, you may have noticed the water there is all yellow and gross looking. Uh, that's because uh, the fire ants in our game have teamed up with... It, it's a little pissy, yeah. Um, <laughs> the fire ants in our game have made a, a coalition with other invasive ants. Tool number three, that's it. Now we've got to go back to Tinker. Um, and those other invasive ants are the yellow crazy ants and the electric ants. And the yellow crazy ants spit acid and, uh, in this case, pollute the waterways. Um, they're kind of Captain Platt villains. All right. And we're back. All right, we've got all the tools. She's going to give us the invention she's been working on, which is, uh, well, so up until this point, it's been a bug game. Um, but with bug games, yeah. So what does the S stand for in Spug Games? Grappling hook. Exactly. <laughs> um, so we now have a grappling hook. Uh, for us to... Oh, go on fast. So it kind of opens up a new layer of exploring the world that I, I think is really fun. And also interacting with little things like these electric coils. If you bash into it, you get a little... This fun little EMP blast, which could be useful at some point, but not at this point. Um, helps you fly over the piss water. <laughs> and uh, one tiny bit more of an arachnophobia warning for this, less severe than the first one. Um, let's see if we can find it. Just Oh, there she is. Yeah. So we got a little friend. Oh, it's a little spin. That's cute. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much all we've got so far. Um, but we're, we're hoping to, you know, we'll be continuing working on it. And, and yeah, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Amazing. I'm back. So next up, we have Tempo Labs with Bits and Bops. Um, they're an amazing little team from New South Wales. And 
just quietly, probably one of my highlights for this evening. I love this game quite a lot. Um, and yeah, I'll put them over to the team. This is our game, by the way. So uh, I'm Rose and this is Evan. Um, thank you for applauding our gameplay demo, uh, gameplay footage. Um, yeah, so we're working on a game called Bits and Bops. Uh, it's a collection of rhythm mini games with 2D graphics, which we're building for PC. Uh, every mini game has unique music, mechanics, and art. At the beginning of each game, you complete a short tutorial to learn its rules, and then you play through it by timing your button presses with the music. The gameplay is designed to reward players for, uh, for listening, but it's also humorous enough that players should hopefully still have fun, even if they're failing. Um, so I work on Bits and Bops as an artist, and for the first half of this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, how we developed our game's visual style. So I have a professional background as a 2D animator for cartoons, um, and this has come in handy because a lot of the design processes and visual language for cartoons works for 2D games as well. So the first thing we developed art for is a mini game called Flipper Snapper. In this game, you play as a photographer and snap photos of a seal as it jumps out of the ocean and hits a beach ball. Um, so here's an early concept that I drew um, to establish the game's visual layout. Since Flipper Snapper was the first thing we built, um, we didn't have any character or background designs. Um, so once we were happy with the layout, Evan traced and colored my art in a different drawing program. <laughs> Um, and made the objects in his sprites so he could build a playable prototype. Um, he also made some of his own drawings to rep represent animations and visual jokes. Um, so here's a hot game dev tip. Um, if you want to make your artist feel really motivated, uh, ask your programmer to do the art instead. <laughs> this will upset the artist that they'll uh, upset the artist enough that they'll feel compelled to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> While it's very fun to laugh at Evan's artwork, um, <laughs> I think drawings of any quality are a great communication tool for game developers, and um, being able to show each other ideas by drawing them in Microsoft Paint has been genuinely useful. Uh, anyway, uh, so once we had a working prototype, we needed some character concepts. Um, I wanted to keep them really simple so that they'd be easy to animate. Um, in cartoons for TV, a lot of effort is put into developing and polishing character concept art. Uh, however, since our characters are lazy and we don't have very many poses, uh, I didn't feel like we needed concept art any more detailed than this. Um, so to polish the game art, I sought guidance from our game's design document. Um, we wrote this document to serve as a sort of pitch bible for bits and bobs developers to reference. Uh, so here are some of the commandments. The idea is that important elements ought to stand out visually in order to make gameplay more intuitive. Um, this ended up being really straightforward for me because, again, the same stylistic techniques are used in cartoons. So here's a still from the final iteration of Flipper Snapper. Um, the background is soft and painterly, and while the important elements, the photographer cat, the seal, and the beach ball, have stronger colors, a flatter style, and darker line art. Um, I did end up committing a a sin. Uh, if you look carefully, the background art does have some outlines. Uh, however, they're a bit more subtle than the foreground, so uh, hopefully I don't end up in purgatory. Um, anyway, that's how we developed our visual style. Um, I'll now let Evan take the stage to talk about a different game design problem. Thank you. Uh, hi, so I'm, I'm Evan. I'm the director and the programmer for Bits and Bobs, and I'd like to talk about uh, the biggest technical challenge that I face bringing the game into reality. Um, but before we can get to that, uh, we kind of need to start with what it is we're trying to build. So what exactly is a rhythm game? Um, at their core, rhythm games are less like traditional video games and more like playing a musical instrument where the game just gives you real-time feedback. 
Um, the feedback comes in two forms, audio and visual. For example, Dance Dance Revolution is a game where you stomp arrows in time with the music. The game gives you visual feedback, the arrows will disappear and your combo goes up, but the game itself doesn't actually give you any audio feedback. Uh, you only get that from the sounds of your feet physically hitting the panels. So in a sense, you can kind of think of Dance Dance Revolution as a drum kit that you play with your feet. Uh, the game gives you visual feedback, but the audio feedback's left up to you. And if you want better feedback, you're gonna have to stomp harder. Uh, but in contrast, there's a subset of rhythm games which use what are called key sounds. For example, Beat Mania or DJ Max or O2 Jam or Bits and Bobs. Uh, and in these games, when you press a button, it immediately plays a sample. So you're not just synchronizing inputs with the music, you're actually playing part of the music yourself. Uh, and that means key sound of rhythm games are less like playing a physical drum kit and more like playing an electronic drum kit. Um, you're not really paying attention to the sound of your drumsticks physically hitting the pads. What you're listening to is the samples that the drum kit plays in your headphones. So with all that in mind, what happens when we try and build this in Unity? Uh, <laughs> so even if you're not a programmer, you can probably guess what this does. Uh, it says, on any given frame, if the player has pressed a key, then play a sound. Um, and so since I'm giving this talk, you've probably guessed it wasn't quite that easy. Uh, I tried this out and it felt terrible. So what you're seeing here is, uh, it was recorded with a microphone. It gives you a visual picture of the time between when I hit the key and when the game plays the sound. Uh, and this is averaging about 160 milliseconds, which is huge. Uh, and if we were selling electronic grum kits and they sounded like this, uh, our company would be out of business. Um, so if, if we're gonna make this game, we need to dig deeper into what's happening here. Um, so before I went down this rabbit hole, this was my understanding of how key sounds worked in Unity. <laughs> when you're using a game engine, you, you kind of expect it to handle these sorts of things for you, right? Um, but unfortunately, Unity's implementation isn't good enough for our particular use case, so I, I had to get my hands dirty. Um, this is a more complete picture of what actually happens when you press a button. Um, there's a lot of steps involved, and each step, step will take some amount of time, and all this time accumulates into the result that we saw earlier. Um, and there's also an added complication here, and unlike the electronic drum kit, uh, we don't control any of the hardware, uh, so we want this to run well on the average user's potato. Uh, so where does this, where does this leave us? Um, if we can't change the hardware, uh, the only thing this leaves us with is the engine code. And so if Unity is not going to cooperate with us, we're going to have to replace it. Um, so now hand-waving over all of the important details in many months of my life. Uh, this is what we got in the end. Um, so we've, we've taken the average down from 160 milliseconds to 30. Uh, and if you use a controller instead of a keyboard, it's even better. Uh, so I, I feel like people weren't sufficiently impressed by the result. <laughs> Thank you for that completely unprompted round of applause. <laughs> uh, so, so after all that, was it actually worth it? Um, so I told myself from the beginning that I wasn't going to make this game if I couldn't make it feel right. Uh, and now, when the game's released, I can stand behind it and proudly say that it represents the way that I think a key-sounded rhythm game should feel. Thank you very much. What's up, gamers? <laughs> Thank you, Tempo Labs, for the talk, for the laughs. Next up, we have Jordan, Catchweight Studios. Jordan is a solo developer. Uh, this is his first commercial game, Conscript, a World War One themed survival horror game. Conscript featured uh, on IGN's awesome indie show in 2021 and was recently showcased in person at Gamescom. So please make Jordan, a good friend of mine, feel welcome. Hello, uh, everybody. Uh, everyone had like the most happy and cheerful game so far, and I'm just gonna like come up here with like the most depressing thing ever. So hopefully it's not too bad. Um, so yeah, uh, my name's Jordan. I'm the solo developer of an indie game called Conscript. Uh, Conscript is essentially a top-down classic survival horror game uh, set in the trenches of the First World War. Can you guys hear me? Is, this, is the mic close enough? Cool. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about my game, um, how it came to be, what it means to me, uh, how I got here, um, and also why I'm making it, I guess. And I'm also going to be like given a bit of a history lesson, which is definitely what everyone came here for and spent their hard-earned money for. But, 
Uh, so some background on me. And I wish I could like show footage as well, but my game's pretty violent. Um, so I guess you could watch trailers uh, after this. <laughs> so I'll just leave you with these screenshots and your mind can fill in the blanks, I guess. Um, so I don't actually have any, uh, as Jared said, I don't have any game development experience. Uh, Conscript is my first ever project. And I started teaching myself uh, how to code and do art and all that kind of stuff uh, when I was in my second year of my history degree back in like 2017. Now, there we go. Uh, arts degrees are like great and all, and I'm happy that I have one, but like, let's be honest, um, I kind of had the startling realization that my history degree wasn't really going to like lead me uh, anywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> traditional like, you know, like tra uh, traditional jobs. So um, that very same day that I had that realization, I just quickly installed Game Maker Studio 2 and started watching like YouTube uh, tutorials and basically started uh, teaching myself coding and logic uh, because making games is secretly what I wanted to do my whole life. It just took me a while to realize that. Ironically, this is also like a few months after I basically failed a logic class at university, so I don't really know what I was thinking, but <laughs> somehow I'm here. Uh, some of my proudest achievements, I won't play this, but uh, one, some of my proudest achievements so far uh, include having my trailer uh, live streamed on the IGN uh, awesome indie show uh, last games come in, in 2021 in front of like, I think it was like 50,000 live viewers, which I was like, I was very scared at like 3 a.m. in the morning um, watching that. I shouldn't have read the comments as, but anyway. <laughs> I won't get into that. Um, I also had a successful Kickstarter in 2020, which was awesome. And I won the uh, Twitter Pitch Your Game Award uh, this year, which was really awesome as well. And my, uh, the thing that I'm most proud of in, is the fact that I uh, got to go to Gamescom this year with uh, many other talented um, Australian game developers, which was like one of the highlights of my life so far. It was awesome. And I was so busy that this, these are literally the only two photos that I took the whole time. <laughs> if I was just like on my feet the whole, anyway, it was, it was intense, but it was awesome. So, oh, next slide, please. Next slide. Next, there we go. So my inspirations, uh, I knew from kind of day one that I would, I wanted to make a mashup, a mashup of survival horror games and history because of my history degree. Um, and I'm a, I've always been a big fan of the Resident Evil games and I was kind of doing a Resident Evil marathon at the time. And the reason that I love classic survival horror games like uh, Resident Evil and Silent Hill is that I love how purposeful their design is. Like every part of the game is kind of handcrafted and it all just comes together to like make this really cohesive experience. And I also feel like they're not that long, they're only like five to six hours and they really respect your time, which I really appreciate as well. And they, they leave a lasting, a lasting impression whilst also respecting your time. And so I knew I wanted to incorporate history into my game, um, but I wasn't exactly sure how to do that and kind of what uh, aspect of history I did want to incorporate. And so I would uh, very soon learn like my first lesson uh, in indie development about scope, which I'm sure we've all dealt with. Uh, which brings me to, I don't know how I made a game. I can't even operate a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> like seriously, there we go. Um, this was my first prototype. Um, it was called Project Able. And this was back in 2018, I think. Basically, um, I released it as like a kind of prototype demo. Um, look at that GIF, that's, that's a fast moving GIF right there. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and so I released this uh, on itch.io itch in 2018 and it ended up getting like a few hundred downloads and I was like going crazy about that. And like a YouTuber with like seven subscribers played it and I was like, oh my God, I've made it. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, the, the concept for this game was he's moving fast. We just came from like the the, the isopod <laughs> going through the screen so fast and then anyway. Okay, I'm clicking things. Okay, there we go. Two slides too far. That's okay. We don't we don't need to see those gifts. 
But the um, the concept of the, of the Project Able was essentially like the way I describe it is that it was like a Super Mario 64, but the horror version where you would go into different paintings and it would take you to different historical periods uh, throughout history. And like looking back, that was a terrible idea because like I said, you need to zone your scope in. And the game just had zero direction at that point and it just really wasn't good either. It was like my first ever thing. So yeah, it was crap, to be honest. <laughs> it's still actually up online. You can play it, but I wouldn't recommend it because it's crap. <laughs> so basically I realized that I had to like pick one setting and just kind of go all in and like further refine that concept as much as I possibly could because there's no way as a one man team that I was going to be able to like do 50 different settings and make the assets for like all these different things. So throughout my degree, I had uh, developed a fascination for the First World War. And so I decided to like really zone in on that and, and pick that as my time period. And it kind of made perfect sense because the First World War was um, known obviously for like, it's very horrific conditions. Um, the trenches, like the mud, the blood and the gas and the, the steel, the barbed wire and all that kind of stuff. Um, and no one had really attempted to make a horror game set in the First World War before. So I thought like, here we go, I've kind of got my, I've got my thing here. And so I kept um, working on it. And so that's how Conscript was born. That's my art. My, I didn't do that. My talented artist did. Um, so yeah. And the game takes place uh, during the Battle of Verdun, which was one of the uh, longest and arguably uh, worst battles of the entire war. Uh, for 300 days and 300 nights, uh, French and German soldiers fought each other like over literally like kilometers of land. And over the course of um, 300 days, 300,000 of those soldiers died, so. Not that, there we go. So you're probably thinking like, why me as an Australian? Why am I not making a game about Australians? Like, that's not very patriotic of you. <laughs> and you're right. Um, it's not. I'm not, because I'm not, this battle had French versus German soldiers, and I'm German, and you spend the majority of the game killing German soldiers, so I don't know what that says about me. But the reason I didn't uh, pick Australia is actually quite simple, and that's because, as you can see, the uh, French soldiers had a bright blue uniform, as opposed to like the darker sort of muted tones of there's another fast gif. That's just. <laughs> um, so the Australian uh, uniforms had kind of like more muted uh, khaki style tones. And so I just feel like it didn't really translate well from a gameplay perspective because as soon as things would get like green, the, the character would camouflage too much with the game. And like, because the game's already so uh, low resolution, you want the player character to always be visible. So that was the main reason, is because they literally just wore blue uniforms. <laughs> Everyone's like, are you French? No, I just, they had blue uniforms. <laughs> just waiting for this massive gift to load. Oh, the computer is not responding. <laughs> Great. Might have to go off the cuff here, because my gifts have crashed the computer. <laughs> this is great. Okay, I'm getting the uh, error. Oh, okay. Here we go. This is the GIF of all GIFs. <laughs> okay, well, by the time that finishes, we'll definitely be kicked out. So that's my game in motion. Um, but another reason that I chose this battle uh, specifically is because it actually also allowed uh, me to have a lot of environment variety in my game, which was important to me because the game's like kind of known uh, right now for the trenches and all that, but I didn't want it to just be known for that. I wanted it to have, because players would get sick of just one location the whole game. So I wanted um, to make sure there was appropriate um, environment variety. And in Verdun, the Battle of Verdun, they fought in the trenches. They also fought in these old kind of 18th century forts, um, which like make for great uh, survival horror locations. They also fought in like towns and, and, and woods and forests and stuff like that. So using this uh, setting really allowed me to get more environment variety uh, from the game, which as I said, was like really important to me. 
So here's just some. Here's, here's the history lesson which you all came to see. Um, so yeah, just loading this GIF. Anyway. <laughs> So basically, like, yeah, picking this time period and having all these uh, locations to choose from uh, allowed me to not be so creatively constrained to just one location in the trenches. And if I was to have picked another battle, you know, that the Australians participated in, like Passchendaele uh, or the Somme, I would have been a little bit more creatively constrained. And basically, as I studied this time period um, for the game, I just became like more and more fascinated with it. And because the soldiers there were living in like the most horrific conditions, basically that any soldier has ever really fought in. Like the disease in the trenches was like rampant. The conditions were just awful. And there was constant artillery bombardment, um, gas attacks, like flamethrower attacks, all that kind of stuff. So in the end, I feel like choosing this time period was the right fit for a survival horror game. And I found that like World War One, not the right word, but not fans, like, what's the word? Enthusiasts. <laughs> You can't be a fan of so that's completely the wrong word. Um, I found that it was the right uh, time period to pick because the World War One enthusiasts um, are very like fanatical and passionate about it for some reason, I guess like me. Um, and so the community that has kind of gathered around the game um, is like a constant source of motivation for me. And they kind of understand uh, my passion for the game and I understand kind of their expectations of what they're expecting from me. And so that really motivates me um, along this journey, because I've been working on this for like five years now by myself. So, and this is kind of what keeps me going, like when I'm feeling burnt out, which is kind of often, but, and so story time. Um, yeah, like I said, I went to Gamescom this year and it was kind of like a freaky coincidence because uh, Verdun, the Battle of Verdun and Verdun is like really close to Cologne where Gamescom is. Um, so it just kind of seemed right that I would go there after Gamescom and do some research. And so I made my way to Verdun after having like studied it for about yeah four or five years at this point, but never actually having been there. And <clears throat> I'm arriving at this place for like the first time, um, like a place that has a lot of meaning to me, even though I've never actually been there. It was like really surreal. And I kind of hiked up for like seven hours into the hills to all the battlefields where my game takes place and found that it had all kind of been overrun, like all the trenches had been completely overrun. And it was like actually a really beautiful forest there now, which is just really surreal. And here's some like comparison shots. This isn't even a GIF. That's just a screenshot. There we go. So these are like the trenches in the game, obviously. And you can still kind of make out the trench lines as you go through the forest, which I found really interesting. Like they're still there. You can still kind of see the remnants of the battle. <clears throat> is a fort in the game. It's like an entrance to a dungeon. And this was the fort from uh, 1916. And then I found it. Oh, that's like great quality too. I found it when I was walking in Verdun just by chance. And that's it now. And it has like completely been overgrown and just been left to time. Here's another uh, comparison shot. That's another um, entrance to a fort. And that's the 1916 reference that I used. And then I found it again, but that's all that remains of it. And it's kind of just been, yeah, like lost to time completely. And I'm, the reason that I'm like telling this in the first place is not to like brag that I got to go on a cool trip and all that. Um, <laughs> but I guess over time, like, the physical scars of the battlefields will kind of go and just be lost to time and be overgrown. And eventually they're just going to completely be gone, right? And so I feel like making Conscript and making games in general kind of give us a chance to like let players go back in time to history and kind of experience things how they were. Um, and yeah, so that's why I'm making Conscript. And that's, um, if I can get to the final slide, <laughs> which is a big thank you slide. I don't know if I will though, but thank you. <laughs> Also, I just want to thank uh, Big Screen real quick because they've uh, supported me a lot and it really means a lot. So, yeah, thank you, Big Screen. Uh, 
Uh, thanks so much, Jordan. Um, our final presenter tonight is Grace from Worm Club. Uh, Grace is a creative director of Worm Club and the Frog Detective series. Since 2016, she has worked on a range of games, including both small scale experimental work and larger commercial projects. She specializes in 3D art, writing, marketing, and social media. She is a, she is a scoundrel. Please be nice to her. If you feed her cauliflower, she will throw it up. Make her feel very welcome. I didn't write that bio. I wrote like, oh, Grace works at Worm Club. That was it. So I don't know where you got that from, but slay. Um, hello, Parallels. Thank you for having us. Uh, Frog Detective 3, there's two other ones, um, is made by Worm Club. Me, Grace Brooksner, Thomas Bowker, Dan Golding, and Olivia Haynes. It is a real game that we made. It's not fake, it's real. This is our first time showing the gameplay publicly. Don't tell anyone what you are about to see here tonight. It is a secret between us. I trust you all with my life, do not betray me. <laughs> this game is really good and that is why it has taken so long. Also, I was joking before when I said you can't tell anyone what you see tonight. Nobody will believe you anyway, so do what you want. <laughs> see if I care. Frog Detective 3 is better than games such as Elden Ring and every Mario game. <laughs> They said to give a heartfelt talk about our game, but I've had a long week and I've used up all my emotions. So here's one heartfelt thing. We really love this game and Frog Detective in general. It's changed our lives so dramatically. Oh, shut up. I hope when you get a chance to play it, you can see the immense growth from the first game and you will understand why it took so long. Also, there was a pandemic, so screw you guys if you were impatient. <laughs> you do not get to live in heaven with me. Enough talking. Here are some friends who will act out the game. Please enjoy from Grace. Um, well, I would like to welcome back in his role as Frog Detective, <laughs> Dr. Dan Golding. <laughs> oh, also, also look at this. Look at this. Do the, do the thing, Tom. Look at this. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah, um, background, you are, the, all the hats in the town went missing, so you got to find them. That's the... I'll say look. <laughs> so it took so long. <laughs> um, yeah, you, the plot, you know. <laughs> Music by Dan Golding. Um, it's fun to zoom around. <laughs> oh, the scooter, don't tell anyone, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, oh, look at him, he's doing nothing. Go back to work, loves the cop. Everyone hates you. Um, uh, let's go to the saloon. Oh, look at those doors, they just opened. Um, yep. What's up here? Maybe we'll go up there. I don't know what to say. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, let's talk to our friend. Who's this? I'll be playing this character. I sit and ponder, detective. Is this theft a bad thing? Perhaps. But who are we to determine good and bad? A stolen hat is a message. Do not let yourself be shielded. The light of the sun holds more answers than we think. Answers to what? 
questions. <laughs> what questions? Why is it so bright out here? <laughs> How do I charge this solar powered bubble head? And more, I'm certain of it. We spend so much time focused on how to find the missing hats and no time considering why we had them in the first place. I would assume for sun protection. Protection from the sun? What harm does the sun pose to us? The sun can be bad for your skin. If I stay in the sun too long, my skin goes all crispy. I turn into a crispy fried snack. Is being crispy wrong, Detective? It's wrong for me. Who are we to determine wrong and right? Well, I'm the frog detective. And I am just a lonely poet trying to make sense of the world. It's nice to meet you. And you. You sure think a lot about things, huh? I try, but I think I get it wrong a lot of the time. Who <laughs> Ha ha. Ha ha. This is the greatest role of my life. If you don't mind me saying, you don't look too much like a cowboy. Oh, I'm no cowboy. I'm Dusty. I'm an outlaw slash poet. I'm trying to compose the perfect cowboy poem. It's taking forever. I am no good at this. But you have so much to say. Yes, but when I write it down, it gets so muddled. Nothing comes out right. I'm sure it sounds great. It doesn't. I'm ashamed to even show anyone. You can show me. I won't judge. Hmm, okay. Um. <laughs> a cowboy's life is so much fun, sitting round on your bum. <laughs> Ride a scooter, sing a tune, say a yeehaw in the afternoon. The sun is bright, their smiles shine brighter when waving at this lonely rider. I give a nod and smile back to you, yet I wish I could be someone new. An outlaw's, an outlaw's life is not for me. I want to ride and be carefree. Instead, I sit and write stuff down, not fitting in with this cowboy town. <laughs> <laughs> That's my poem. It's beautiful. <laughs> I would say that's the perfect cowboy poem. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, but I want to write a new one. Do you mind if I ask you some questions about the case? Go ahead. Harry, how are we for time? It's late. All right. Well, there you go. There's Frog Detective 3. <laughs> Whose phone is that? Can we? So then? Well, so that was parallels. Huge. Um, sorry we went a bit over. Um, but, but it was worth it. What an amazing collection of developers and games, all uh, from Australia, which is very cool. We have, we're you know, very much punching about above our weight, I think. Um, but before we wrap up, I'd really love to get um, everyone from Paper House up here because they're bloody legends. And, um, We've worked so, so hard uh, getting absolutely everything together. Um, particularly a shout out to Cole. Who <laughs> who's probably one of the strongest designers in the country, graphic designers, uh, just absolutely incredible. Um, when we first 
got on Parallels and we were talking about doing it, the brief basically was, what if we made it look like DJ Hero? And that was it. And <laughs> look what they've done. Like, it's absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. Um, we've come up with just so many different things to try and push and promote all the different games and this event throughout, throughout over the months. And, and all of it's like testament to Cole and their work. So again. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to give a quick shout out to just everyone as all the different individuals. So Pat Jarrett has popped up. Um, he's come on a little bit last minute and just kicking all our bums. Uh, we've got Sam Crisp, who's just absolutely amazing. Got a mind that will crush you. <laughs> Jack on the end here, who's just illust illustrations and just art, just in a huge heart, absolute huge heart. And Mickey, who's come on doing some technical jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so just also wanted to say thanks again to Freeplay for just kind of handing us the keys and just letting us basically do whatever we wanted. Um, yeah, sorry for shutting down the zone. That was my idea. I'm happy to take that, but too bad. We're all here, so it doesn't affect us. Um, <laughs> now, before we go, we thought we'd do something a little bit cheeky, and we're going to quickly show you something we've been working on. This we got to do the thing. <laughs> Also, shout out for Dan Golding, of course, who did all the music. Uh, and Michael from Kapow, who's been doing um, all the audio and everything. Um, so, yeah, that's it. That's Parallels 2022. We did it. So, Massive Monster uh, hosting the official after party. It's going to be pretty wild. We've got a bunch of things going on. Um, just head on over to John Curtin, just up the road, just from Trades Hall. Um, it's going to be pretty squishy, but it's going to be really fun. There's a bunch of DJs, bunch of music. So shout out to Massive Monster again for putting that on for us. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>